Might be seated. Hey, church family. Um, my name is Christy Riggs, and Stephanie is out today. So she asked me a couple weeks ago, God worked it out, that I was already going to be here um, to tell you about the Simply Beautiful Prom Dress Ministry. <laughs> And this is something near and dear to my heart. Um, I substitute teach at the high school and middle school. And in 2019, I was talking with some girls, and they were saying they couldn't go to prom because they couldn't afford a prom dress. We moved here about five years ago. So I said, well, don't y'all have one of those things where you can go and get a dress, like an organization that has free prom dresses or cheap prom dresses for you? And they're like, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No, we don't have anything like that around here. And so I started doing some research, and sure enough, there is an organization like that called um, Cinderella's Closet, Western Kentucky. It's in Owensboro, and that is the closest place to do that. Um, each school has a family resource center, but they only have limited space in the um, family resource center here in Trick County. She had a few prom dresses, but not really not really much and so um, I kind of threw it on Facebook and I said you know does anybody have a prom dress we've got a girl looking and kind of connected and this church actually I had somebody from church that had a dress that size and somebody else bought her shoes and um, that family came to church and we went over to the Sunday school building they tried on the dress and um, anyway it worked, worked out she was able to go to prom that year and her mom has since told me that had we not worked that out, she would not have gone to prom. Well, I started doing some more research. And sometimes sometimes when you see a need and you wish that somebody else would do something, it ends up that you end up having to do it. Um, so I started a prom dress ministry. So I started collecting dresses that year. And I said, okay, 2020 is going to be the big, we're going to start this prom dress ministry. Well, prom in Trigg County didn't happen in 2020. But the homeschool group in Hopkinsville had their um, formal, and there was a father-daughter dance. So we were able to give away about five, five prom dresses that year. I had a couple that were local that just got their dress a little too early before prom was canceled. So I had two more that the dresses were just kind of out there. But last year, we were able to actually have a big giveaway, all the dresses came here at that time I had about 200 dresses collected they were completely free um, if the girls wanted to come we set up in the fellowship hall set up some of the Sunday school classrooms as dressing rooms I put mirrors in there blacked out the windows and just kind of made it pretty for the girls um, we had a bunch of volunteers that came that Thursday night in the pouring down rain thunderstorm we set it up Thursday night Friday Saturday we had the giveaway and then Saturday afternoon Again, a team of volunteers putting everything away. Um, so we had about 200 dresses. I was able, last year we gave about 25 away, and that represents eight different schools here in Western Kentucky, um, including the homeschool group. And um, so th that was pretty neat. So we're, Todd County, some people came down from Todd County, where, I mean, it's not just Trigg County that's, that's being helped here. Um, someone online, a Facebook friend of mine in Clarksville, saw that I was sharing last year she said hey our church used to do something like this and we have all the dresses but we don't do it anymore 
um, she brought me about 300 more dresses. So there's about 500 dresses right now in a storage room upstairs at my house. Um, February 11th and 12th is going to be the, the giveaway here, and we're going to do it here again in Liberty Point um, Fellowship Hall. We're going to set up the, the Sunday school classrooms again. Um, one of the things I was hearing last year were the girls saying, well, I don't want to take away if, if a girl can't afford a dress. I don't want to take away. No, that is not the case. Come here. Check this inventory first. You may find a dress. You may not find a dress. The giveaway is in February, so it's early enough to get altered. Um, give a donation if you don't want to take a free dress. Like, that's okay, too. There are things that, um, that we could use money for, too. Um, just even simple things like boosting the Facebook posts. That's a dollar, two dollars a day, you know, just little things. But um, the process is I have the girls sign up. Um, so far, we've got 11 signed up, and I haven't started advertising or anything yet for this year. Um, this week, I got permission from the principal at the high school that we're going to do an email. It's going to go on the announcements. I'll be hanging flyers around the school, that kind of stuff. Um, I've got some girls from a sorority in Murray State that comes down. Um, they help the girls as personal shoppers and kind of take them around, greet them at the door, kind of find out what size they're looking for, what style they're looking for, and kind of help run back and forth so the moms can help with the zipping or the sisters or whoever they come with. Um, let's see. Got my notes, sorry. Um, how can you help? You can pray for this ministry. I would love to see it grow. Um, I don't do shoes. I don't do jewelry. Like, so far, it's just dresses. But there's so many more needs. Hair, hair is a need. Uh, makeup is a need. Like, there's just so many more things. And then I've had several people ask about tuxes for guys. That's also a need. But right now, just doing dresses. So pray that this ministry would grow, but not too fast, and that people would step up to, to help with it. Um, Speaking of help, if you want some hands-on help, you can come that Thursday night, the 10th. All the dresses are currently in a room upstairs at my house, so they got to come from there down and get set up here at the church. So that's that's a need, driving, if you're willing to drive some stuff, if you just want to meet here and help hang them on the racks, um, take it down <laughs> at the 12th, the same thing, and we got to figure out exactly where they're going. Um the, that weekend, that Friday night, Saturday, the, perfect timing. There was a picture of Amy up there sewing. Sometimes we find that there's little things that need to be done to just kind of make them just right. So if you want to come the Friday or Saturday and help, if you sew, if you want to bring a sewing kit, if you just want to help keep things organized and running, that's good too. Um, we could use some help over the weekend. Um, as far as long-term, the racks that the dresses are on are all borrowed. Um, I'd love to build or have some that are kind of belong to the ministry and not necessarily borrowed. Um, some of the dresses come and they need dry cleaning. Well, it's just me right now, <laughs> so I'm not not able to, to dry clean the dresses. Um, some of the uh, sewing, there's some rips and tears, that kind of stuff, so, couple of really nice dresses and the zippers are busted and for me to pay to get them fixed it might maybe go it's just too much but that's something you know long term and then um, some steamers if you've got one of those iron steamer things to smooth out the dresses if you've got one of those you'd like to donate that'd be great um, but anyway I have a flyer and I have more, like I said, they'll be going all through the schools and everything this week. But if you have any questions, let me know. If you know somebody that's going to prom and they, they're they going to need a dress, have them check here first and keep it local. And, you know, they're not taken away from somebody that needs it, I promise. There's plenty. So, all right, thank you. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful, uh, Lord, for those who are willing to be your hands and feet in tangible ways. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that we would not only be able to, to offer uh, prom dresses, but, Father, to be able to, to share with people uh, how God sees uh, each individual and how he has a plan and a purpose for their life. Lord, again, we thank you for all that you do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
stand once again as we sing the hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. Mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the big
water you turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome and power our Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is here Awesome and power our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is for us, then what can stand against? If what can stand against? appreciate you praise team thank you for all that you do in leading us to, to worship the Lord if you brought your Bibles with you this morning I invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew Matthew chapter 8 is where we'll begin here in just a moment uh, I was uh, left kind of uh, asking the Lord which direction he wanted us to go and uh, following our our stewardship sermon series and have been praying about it and uh, before we, we get into our next series, I, I wanted to, to take one more, uh, one more stab, one more step, one more uh, sermon in the direction of next steps. Uh, not only for us as a church, but in particular, a, a next step for, for individuals who are following Christ. Uh, uh, and, and so this next step is going to really focus on our priorities uh, as individuals and as a church. Uh, priorities are something that, that I think a lot of times uh, we, we don't really uh, put enough emphasis on them in our, in our personal lives. Uh, I've read a story, fans of the American Wild West. Uh, if you like Westerns, uh, you probably have heard of uh, the Deadwood Museum in Deadwood, South Dakota. Um, there's a museum, and, and on the front of this museum, there's an inscription that was left by a prospector. 
those that were out, uh, out west searching for gold. This, was the, this is the inscription that's left there at the, the Wild West Museum in Deadwood, South Dakota. It says, I lost my gun. I lost my horse. I'm out of food. The Indians are after me, but I've got all the gold I can carry. <laughs> Priorities certainly uh, have an important role in our lives. Uh, I'm sure that gold was valuable, but it didn't do him much good when he had lost everything else. And so this morning, I want to ask us, as we look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 8, I, I want to ask us where our priorities are. And then not only where our priorities are, but what those priorities look like and, and, and how we have, uh, have them in our lives. If you found your place in Matthew 8, we'll begin reading in verse 18. I invite you to stand with me if you're able as we honor the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Scripture says, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful, uh, Lord, for a chance to be able to come together and to worship you as we've had the opportunity this morning. But Father, now to be able to turn to your word and hear directly from you today. So God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Father, may we leave here changed because of what you have to say to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. If I had to give a, give a title to our, our sermon this morning, it would be Next Step Discipleship. Next Step Z Discipleship. You know, we've always heard people uh, talk about discipleship, especially in church. We used to have uh, discipleship training, uh, an hour set aside a week uh, for discipleship training. And, and we talk a lot about discipleship, but, but you know, really and truly, I'm afraid that the word has been lost uh, in, in our American church. Uh, we, we know what the word means, but we don't actually put it into practice very often. And, and so this morning, I, I want to talk to you about what it means to, to be a disciple and, and what that next step discipleship actually looks like. And so if, if you're here this morning and, and God speaks to your heart uh, about you taking a next step, I pray this morning that you'll be encouraged and that he would give you the guidance and direction on, on what that next step looks like. Back in the text here, Jesus has a, has a large crowd following after him. And he sends uh, to, to go over to the other side and the crowd gathers once more. Uh, and Jesus always has a way of when he has a huge following of saying things that sometimes dwindles the crowd a little bit. And this is uh, one of those cases as well, uh, no exception here. Uh, Jesus has a large following, and in verse 19, one of those who is following after him and listening to his messages comes up to him, and in verse 19 says, and a scribe came up to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, in the church, we would be excited. We'd go, praise the Lord, this person wants to follow Jesus. We would all exclaim, man, this is the best news that's ever happened. Praise God. But that's not how Jesus responds. Jesus doesn't throw a party. He doesn't say, thank me. Uh, he, he, he doesn't do any, any of that. There's not, there's not a lot of excitement. In fact, Jesus basically gives a warning. The, the scribe it, it comes to Jesus I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus' response is, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. You see, Jesus' response is, there's a cost to following me. It, it, it's going to cost you something to, to be a follower of Jesus. He, he, he wants to know up front, hey, this isn't just something you go into lightly. And maybe that's where we've made a mistake uh, in, in sharing the gospel and in encouraging people to follow Jesus. Uh, we, we don't often share, hey, this is a bigger deal than maybe you're even thinking. This thing is going to cost you something. Jesus said, uh, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Foxes have a place to go to sleep. Birds have a place to go to sleep. I, I don't even have a home. 
Uh, and so Jesus wants this scribe to understand that there's a cost. I, I think we, we understand this in every other area of our life, but we don't often think about it when it comes to the church. Right? When, when we're dealing with uh, jobs, we understand, hey, you got to put in the work if you want to get the result. Uh, when, it, when it comes to working out, to physical uh, health or physical fitness, hey, you gotta, you got to put in the work if you want to get the result. We, we understand it in every other area, but not necessarily when it comes to following Christ. We don't often talk about the cost or the work that you've got to put in in order to be able to, to be a follower of Jesus. I was playing middle school basketball. I've told this story before, but y'all bear with me if you've heard it. I was playing middle school basketball. Ben Bruce was our middle school basketball coach. Man, I thought the world of Coach Bruce. And uh, we were decent. We, we weren't good, but we were decent. Uh, we thought we were really good. Uh, and so we were practicing in the high school gym. I'll never forget it. Practicing in the high school gym, getting ready for our district tournament. And uh, one of my friends was kind of taking it easy at practice that day. He, he wasn't really putting in the full effort. And so Coach Bruce stopped practice. And he looked at my friend. And he, his name was Justin. He looked at my friend Justin. He said, Justin, do you want to be good or do you want to be mediocre? And Justin kind of put his head down. He said, man, I don't know. And I, uh, Coach was kind of taken back. He, 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 didn't, he didn't expect that response from Justin. And he said, so I asked the question again. He said, what do you mean you don't know? Do you want to be good or do you want to be mediocre? He said, coach, I, I don't know. I don't know. He just had his head hanging there. He said, what do you not know? He said, I, I don't know what mediocre means. <laughs> you see, coach, coach was really trying to make this point of, man, if you want to be good, you got to put in the effort. You got to put in the work. But it went straight over my buddy because he didn't understand. He didn't know what mediocre meant. So he didn't know which side he was supposed to be on. Am I supposed to be good or am I supposed to be mediocre? I'm not sure, coach. Which one do you want me to be? But see, church, I, I want us to understand that Jesus, even those that were excited about following him, uh, the, the scribe is not a disciple at this point. It, Jesus uh, calls, or Matthew records that, that he is a scribe. He, he's not a, a, a disciple at this point. This guy is new to the game. He comes in with an excitement, and Jesus says, hey, I want you to understand, there's going to be a cost. It, there's, some, there's some work involved. There, there, there's some sacrifices that are going to have to be made in order for you to actually live up to what you just said you were willing to do. You said you would follow me wherever, but I want you to understand that there's a cost to that. There's two people in this exchange. We see not only the scribe, but in verse 21, we see of, a, of another individual. Verse 21 says, another of the disciples. So this guy is a follower already. He's a disciple of Jesus. He's already been a part of this. And so, uh, unlike the scribe, this guy's already made his commitment. And so another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. You see, Jesus' response here should not catch us by surprise. In fact, it's the same two words at the beginning of this that he has used to call all of the, of the disciples. Uh, Jesus' recruiting uh, philosophy was real simple. Follow me. He uses the same two words over and over and over again in calling many of the disciples. Simply follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Or sometimes it's simply just follow me. And people have left everything and gone to follow Jesus. This disciple has heard this before. This is not new uh, that, that he's hearing. And so when he says, hey, First, let me go and deal with something else. Let, let me stop what I'm doing and go and deal with this. And Jesus says, hey, let me just remind you, follow me was what got you into this, and it's what I'm going to keep repeating. So he says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. In other words, somebody else can take care of that. I've got something else in store for you. I've got things that are much more important 
things that, that are dealing with life and death, things that are dealing with, with eternal life. And, and so Jesus makes two different responses to these people who are saying, Jesus, let me follow you. For the one who's not a believer, who's not a follower, he says, count the cost. Understand that there's something to be sacrificed here. And to the one who's already a follower, he says, don't quit now. So church, I don't know which one of these you're in this morning. So let's take just a moment and, and do some general reflection. If we were to look at the priorities of our lives this morning, if we were to say, uh, honestly, I'm not asking for, for hands raised or anything of the sort, but in your own heart this morning, if I were to ask you if Jesus were your number one priority, would you be able to say without any hesitation, yeah, he my number one, Jesus is the priority of my life. I, I think if we're all honest here, we, we might say it depends on the day. If we're all honest even a little further, we might even say it depends on the moment. Yeah, we might have the best of intentions, but let's be honest. Is Jesus really priority number one? Now, I want to take that same thought. Maybe you've thought in your mind a list of priorities. Maybe you thought, yeah, Jesus is at the top. I feel good. Paxton just reaffirmed. Jesus is supposed to be number one. Jesus is number one in my life. Then we got some other stuff underneath. Maybe, maybe Jesus, family, friends, school, work. I don't know what order you got going on here, but, but Jesus is at the top, so I feel really good about everything. Now, I, I, I want to push back against that for just a moment. Maybe Jesus is not supposed to be the top of the list. Maybe, in fact, there's not even supposed to be a list. What if we looked at things a little bit differently? And maybe this morning you would say Jesus is at the top and you've got all these other things underneath that. But what if I told you that Jesus was supposed to be a part of every priority? That he's not just top of the list, but what if I told you that, that maybe he was supposed to be the center of everything. So instead of a list of priorities, what if we had Jesus at the center and everything else revolved around him? I believe with everything that I am that that's what our priorities are supposed to look like. It's not just Jesus and so I can check that off and feel better, but if Jesus is supposed to be the center of everything, maybe, maybe I'm falling a little bit short. There was a, a, a painting done by a German painter whose name was uh, Adolf Menzel. And Adolf Menzel lived from 1815 to 1905. And this piece of art is one of the last works that he did. And it's actually in a, in a Berlin art gallery. The, the piece is only partially finished. It was intended to show Frederick the Great speaking with some of his generals. The, the painter painted the generals and the background, and he left the king until last. He put an outline of Frederick in charcoal, but died prior to finishing it. You see, he had painted everything else that was supposed to be a part of the picture. The background was completed. The other generals were completed, but he left out what the painting was really about. I'm afraid that, that there are probably a lot of Christians in the world today who come to the end of their life and they've got a beautiful background. Man, they've lived life to the fullest. They've done a lot of wonderful things. They, they've even got some, some great characters that are part of the painting of their life. But I'm afraid many of them have only penciled in the most important thing. He's there. Jesus is part of my life. He's, he's there. But, but we forgot about finishing the thing that was the most important. You see, church, if, if we're actually going to live this life, understand the cost of following Jesus, it's not just Jesus as part of my life, but Jesus is my life, that he's the center and everything else comes off of that and is supported by that. If Jesus is not at the center of who you are, church, I'm afraid that we've missed what next step discipleship is really all about. You see, you can't just have Jesus added on to the list of things. Jesus has got to be it. We either live for Jesus or we're living for something else. Let's be honest. And so as we take stock of our priorities this morning, 
Church, let's be honest. Is Jesus even on the list if there is a list? But more importantly, is Jesus at the center of your life? A friend of mine went as a mission trip to India. and He was excited about, about sharing the gospel. And as a, as a young high school student, he was going to take India by storm. And so, man, he landed on the ground and began talking with a missionary, and he told him, he said, I don't want to waste any time. I want to start sharing with people today. Can I, can I have a translator go with me and start sharing the gospel? And the guy said, absolutely. He said, but you need to understand that, that culture is, is very different here. He said, I, I, that's fine, that's fine. I just I want to go share the gospel. And so he stopped at the first home that he came to and knocked on the door and began to share the gospel with this family. The family was extremely welcoming and very, very receptive to this message. And so this young high school student who's serving as a missionary uh, tells them about Jesus and how Jesus has uh, died to, to pay for our sins, that he literally took our sins upon himself and he paid the price that we could never pay, and that if we would repent of our sins and trust in Jesus, that he would save us from our sins and give us eternal life with him. And man, this family was so receptive they said, we want to do that. And so he, he leads them in, 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 in understanding prayer, and, and they pray this prayer where they're, they're trusting in Christ. And this young missionary, high school student, comes back to the missionary home, and he shares this story. He goes, man, I'm so excited. The first home I stopped at, I was able to share, uh, share the gospel, and these people trusted in Christ. And the missionary who, help? who lived there and worked there said, uh, said I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure you understand how, how things work here. He said, well, what do you mean? He said, they, they prayed to receive Christ. I shared the gospel. They, every, everything was good. He goes, no. He said, you see, he said, they, they're willing to add Jesus, but they're not willing to only trust in Jesus. He said, well, I, I don't think I'll follow. He said, we'll, we'll go back to that home tomorrow, and, 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 and hopefully you're right, and hopefully I'm wrong. So the next day they... They go back to the home where the uh, young missionary had shared the gospel, and they go in, and the family welcomes them and is so excited to see them. And they said, we, we wanted to show you something. They said, we, we put up a picture of Jesus in our home. And sure enough, they had gone out that evening and got a picture of Jesus and put it up on their wall, along with about 100 other photos of Hindu gods. The missionary said, you see what I mean? He said, all, all they did was added Jesus to everything else. And he said, that's not a saving faith. A saving faith is not adding Jesus to what you believe. A saving faith is trusting only in Jesus because he's our only hope. And the young missionary finally understood, was able to, to start talking about the exclusivity of the gospel, how, how Jesus was the only way. And that anything else, if we're putting our hope in anything else, it will let us down, but Jesus won't. Church, that's a, a story from across the world, across the globe, but it's a story I see far too often in American Christianity as well. You see, there's a lot of people in church who said, yeah, yeah, I got Jesus too. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've trusted in Jesus, but what they're really trusting in is being a good person. They, they think that, that all it takes is being, being an okay kind of person. Well, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm, all right. I'm better than they are. Or, or they're, they're trusting in, in their family. My, my, my parents were good people. They went to church. They, they might even be trusting in church membership. Yeah, I'm a member of such and such Baptist church. Or the one that gets me the most is, yeah, I was baptized. You see, all of those things are good things. Man, it's, it's great to be good people. It's great to have good family. It's great to be a member of a church. It's great to be baptized. Church, hear me. None of those things will save you. None of them. The only thing that will save, the only thing that will offer us eternal security is Jesus Christ alone. So church, if, if Jesus is one of our priorities, I'm afraid we've already messed up because Jesus has got to be the center of our lives. Nothing else will do. Nothing else is good enough. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Paxton, you know, I've got to be honest with you. 
I've been a member of a church. I've gone to church my whole life, whatever it might be. Maybe this is your first time at church. But I know I don't have Jesus at the center of my life. During our time of invitation, I'm going to stand right down here, and I would love for you to be able to come and and share with me that you want to have Jesus at the center. I would love to be able to talk to you about what that looks like, not just adding Jesus to the mix, but about what it looks like to surrender your life to Jesus. I'd love to be able to talk to you about that. Or maybe you say, Paxton, you know what? I know I'm a Christian. I know I've got things right with the Lord, but he's not in his proper place. Maybe this is a a time for you to respond and say, you know what? I need to get Jesus back to the center, back to the place where he belongs. Maybe you've been living outside or maybe Jesus is on the peripheral and it's time to get him back to where he belongs, back to the center. Whatever it is that God has laid upon your heart, I pray during this time you can just respond to him. Maybe you need to come down and pray or maybe you'd like for me to pray with you. Whatever it is, let's be obedient to the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to to hear your word, and Father, now to have the opportunity to respond to it. Father, I pray that we wouldn't take these moments lightly, that, Father, we would seriously look at what our next step in following you is supposed to look like. Father, I pray that we would take that next step discipleship, whether that be uh, the first step in trusting Christ as our Savior and Lord, or Father, whether that be the step that says, you know what, I've not been doing it right, and God, I want to make sure that you're at the center of my life. God, we don't need you on the top of our priority list. God, you need to be in every one of our priorities. God, you need to be at the center of our lives. So Lord, we pray that you would use this time for your glory and your glory alone. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it. I thank you so much for being here this morning. I do pray that you would continue to, uh, to pray for our folks that are, that are not feeling well. Mr. Joe uh, Anderson is still in the hospital. Pray for him. Uh, Ms. Connie Anderson uh, in the hospital. Pray for her as well. Uh, and I, I know we've got others that are still battling uh, COVID and other things. Continue to pray for Ms. Cinda Fusler uh, as well. Uh, and then certainly Ms. Christine uh, today as she has the, the funeral for her sister. Certainly want to continue to remember uh, each of those. Again, I invite you to come and be with us tonight, six o'clock, uh, right here. Uh, there won't be, uh, we won't have any uh, any child care uh, tonight, but I do invite you. Uh, don't don't worry about that. Come and be with us, uh, and, and we'll have uh, have a great time talking about what it means uh, to to be a member here at Liberty Point. Anyone else have anything on your heart before we dismiss? All right, brother Ken, would you care to close us in prayer? Mm-hmm.